Scooby. Darn you, Scooby. You know that's going to make the tape now. Is it? Yeah. Welcome. Today That Hope with Father Dave and Deacon Bob, seeing humor and hope in a crazy world. And I'm Deacon Bob. And I'm Father Dave, and it's nighttime. Woo! Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody said, uh, actually, my mother said she likes when we record at night, but uh, somebody else emailed me. Actually, texted. We, we, we got some text and responses. That's enough. Oh, it's going to stop. We got text <laughs> and responses of people's of the show last week. First off, mm. of three people who reached out and said, uh, Father Dave, you need to put your degrees on the wall. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Have you done it yet? No. <laughs> I have I to bet, find them. I bet you can get a nice deal at uh, Catholic to the Max. Oh, they would frame it for me? Oh, yeah. They frame things really nicely. Okay, but I was thinking maybe I'll just have you make me one. You know? <laughs> no, I can make you a replica diploma. Okay. okay. I can make your diploma look better, but I can't. Make I don't degree. frame things. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of. So that was fun. Somebody uh, reached out and said, uh, two pe- three people reached out and said we had to put them out. What was the other thing? Oh, they said um, they like when we record at night because, did they say we're more lively? We're more energetic? I forget what they said. But we're at night, so we're recording so tonight, So we're doing folks. it again, baby. So hold on, folks. Cheers yes. to everybody. <laughs> exactly. This is just well, ice and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Barley. Yeah. <laughs> Wheat. Yeah, barley. Rye. Barley. I don't know. Barley. <laughs> so I'd, hello, everybody. Hey, how was your vacation? Yeah, I just got, I mean, I literally just got yeah, he, back yeah, about an hour ago. I got a I text. Uh, yeah, I got a text. He said, we're on. Plane was on. The plane was on time. Plane. I also will say... I got a text yesterday from Bob that said, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Father Dave, would you pray for my family, my wife, a couple of the kids? They're stuck on a plane somewhere. And he said, just pray. So it, was, I did. it was really ugly. I, uh, when, we, when we planned this vacation originally, the costs of the flights were so high, we decided that half of us would drive, half would fly. Being the good husband that I am, I said, I will fly. I mean, I'll drive, sorry. And you, you fly, and I wanted her to have a great trip. So I was... I was driving both ends of it. Well, last minute. And, and we had said, that would be kind of fun. You'd uh, go down with your boys. That would be a good time. And that seemed like a good time. Or? Well, we found some last-minute flights that were crazy cheap. And as we did the calculation for the gasoline. Oh, I'll bet. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we just decided, you know, we can actually fly. So I had a little bit of odder times to fly. It was like crazy early on Thursday morning. And then I, I couldn't get out on Sunday at all, so we just left on Monday. But I would have been driving home Monday anyway. So my flights were super smooth, and my poor wife was not. Oh my gosh, they got trapped in Baltimore. There were cancellations. Southwest is that what they? Yeah, were? Okay. it was Southwest, and then they got stuck in Baltimore and ended up renting a car. Oh, they did end and up driving. Well, I thought your last text said, "Never mind, they're on the plane." Well, no, they got on the plane from Orlando to Baltimore. Okay, okay. But then they were stuck in Baltimore, and they weren't able to get them out for another day, and so they just rented a car and drove. And hopefully Southwest will pay for all of it. I don't know. Southwest is pretty good about stuff like that. That must have been nuts. It was pretty bad. Meanwhile, I just hung out all day. (laughs) Yeah, you with the boys. At Universal (laughs) Studios with a few of my boys. And then I took a direct flight home. Okay, so tell me how you did. I was just talking with somebody. um, We had a a trip to Philadelphia today. It was just lovely and a wonderful trip. And we're we're just, we've got the best donors and friends of the university. And they took us to lunch. It was just wonderful. But one of the things he said is he said he's he's learned that he can't go home and say, I had the most amazing lunch. because no. it's, So like you say to your wife, it's like, oh, it was all right. We just. No, 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 no. You can. The, the trick is. OK. So you, how are you doing? Me. Always ask them first okay. how they're doing. OK. And you can match. You can. You don't you, want to get better. You can't get better, okay. but you can match that. Okay. So hopefully she's having a fantastic day, and I can say, I'm having a great time, too. And if she's like, oh, it's really tough. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, the sun is really hot. Yeah. yeah, you know, you just try to, yeah, you, you're allowed to match, but okay. not surpass okay. Okay. your okay. wife's experience at home. Oh, see, because that's what he said. He, he said it was an event one time. He went back, and he said, honey, it was the most amazing. Oh, and, and rookie. she said, really? Rookie. Yeah, 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 that's right. She said, and, and I was taking care of the six kids that were screaming and pulling <laughs> hair, and, and nobody was eating You know, the thankfully, sticks. there was a time or two that my wife did travel with me, like especially when I do speaking events, and she was so disappointed in the experience, she would rather stay home. I mean, you know how it is. Sometimes a lot. I travel around the country, which is to say – I go to an airport, I usually go to a high school gymnasium, I do a sound check, I do an event, I go to like maybe Hampton Inn because I'm fancy, Yeah. and then I get the 5 a.m. shuttle and I go back to the airport and that's me seeing the world. So I love doing it because I love the ministry, but it's definitely not, I'm not in it for the perks. Yeah, it's not as romantic as one might think. Though adult conferences are different. 
I just don't do many of them. Yeah. I mean, adult, con- I've been to a few adult conferences and I mean, they're like, you know, pick somebody picks you up and they have a nice meal with the bishop or the archbishop or the cardinal and they're very fancy, but I'm more like the youth ministry vibe. Like, you know, it's, Piece of the, pizza. it's the Toyota yeah, Corolla yeah, and they're right. moving the pizza box in the front seat so you can right. sit down. But that's actually right. I just, that's kind of more my speed. That's so cool. it's really fun. So but Universal was fantastic. Was yeah. yeah. Hadn't so been there in many years. Okay. Busy, crazy. It was pretty full. Yeah. It was pretty full, but it didn't feel overwhelming. How long do you have to wait to get on a ride? Well, I I splurged and I got the express pass. Okay, so and uh, I was usually waiting maybe ten minutes to a half hour tops to get on rides. And, and that's ri- quick. And that's pretty quick. But if you and don't the do lines that, themselves how long do you have fun. to wait? It would depend on the ride. Like some rides are like an hour. Like an what's hour a great and a half. ride? A great ride. Yeah, there. Um, any of the Harry Potter stuff is really great, and mm-hmm. those were usually running about an hour to ninety minutes. But we were able to get on them within fifteen minutes. And the fun thing about those rides is the lines are super cool. Like the lines are all interactive, and they have things going on. They take you like, especially the first Harry Potter ride. They take you like through Hogwarts, and it's like room to room, and there's like these videos, and they make them look like they're standing right in front of you, and like the pictures are talking to each other. I mean, it's it's really cool. You actually don't even feel like you're waiting in a line. You'd have to do that because the ride takes how long? Oh, the ride's like just a few minutes. Maybe, so to wait maybe 90 f- minutes for a four-minute ride? It's a little crazy. Yeah. But it's a theme park, Bob. Kids had fun? Kids had a great time. We all had a great time. It was Did great. you miss me? Oh, tremendously. Like, seriously, how many times did oh, you hey. guys say, gee, it would be nice to have Father Dave here? Yeah. So, um, you didn't answer the question. What? I, uh, this sounds kicking sounds in a little bit. Sorry, I can't hear. Static. Um, one of the fun things we did is we went to uh, the improv comedy club that I used to work at back in the days when I was in Orlando. And I took the whole family to see it because they've heard about me talk about it at times. And uh, they, I, you know, we saw a show and I had some friends there who were way back in the day when I was there. They're now like a vice president of it. And, and so they said, hey, we're short a person. Do you want to just be the guest star for the next show? I was like, my first reaction was no, because I thought, I have such good memories of being funny on this stage. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah, want to yeah. ruin it. But they're like, no, come on, we could really use you. And I just thought, okay. And it was so fun. I wasn't horrible. Your, all your I kids were there. there was and all my kids show. were there, and they got to see me do improv. Uh, it's SAC, the SAC Comedy Lab, S-A-K Comedy Lab. It's a great place. Check it out. Family friendly. Uh, yeah, you know, that's one of the no, things I ask. You know, yeah, no swearing. No, really crass, no, 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 not at all. That's actually kind of what it's known for, to not be yeah. to not be that way. Really clean improv. And it was just a blessing. I was, you know, I went down. This is, I think, my 17th, 25th anniversary trip that I've mm. taken so far. And just kind of reflecting on being 50, being married 25 years just being able to get back on, doing something I never thought I would do. I never yeah. thought I would get back on stage with a couple friends that I was on stage with in the early 90s. It was That's really, really it was really a source of joy for me. It was it was very, very cool. Did you talk about being a deacon? <laughs> did it come on, up? On stage? No. It did, <laughs> it did not happen to come up during, okay. during that it time. Did. No. no. Uh, surprisingly. Huh. That's yeah. interesting. I would yeah. have thought that would have been one of the main topics. Yeah, yeah. What was kind of, what was the piece that you did? Oh, gosh, I don't even remember. I mean, it, because it's all improv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're just making things up as you go along. Um, the big difference between improv and stand-up, stand-up, one person on a stage, they craft all their jokes. Improv, you really trust the other people on a stage. You build on each other. Somebody does yeah. something, you say yes and to that, and you just have a lot of fun. But I rarely remember any of the nights. How long except, was the piece? Well, I was on stage. It was about an hour and a half show with a 10, 15-minute intermission. And we, we broke up in teams, and we did – skits and we got scored for them by the audience and it was great that's so funny it was really really great i would have loved to be there yeah i wish you would have been there i didn't go on vacation oh but i did go to a baseball game okay which was great yeah oh we need to do our sports update for that sister who needs to yep yep so baseball game uh the cardinals against the pirates obviously and the cardinals won five to four which was fine with me i like the cardinals because they're a baseball town uh, the thing that was kind of exciting this is... This would the, be St. Louis. Yeah, exactly. The kid that was pitcher for the St. Louis is his first major league game. And that's always fun. There's kind of a, cool. yeah. a, There's a fun vibe in the air about it. He ended up winning. He won the game technically, but he, I think they pulled him after about five and a half innings. But okay. it was actually, it was a gorgeous night. It was nice. 70 degrees, beautiful. PNC is beautiful. And then afterwards, they had a fireworks night, which was 
fantastic and everything about the night was great. Oh, that's great. Yep. Uh, update on the NHL NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. Yep. The Tampa Bay Lightning are destroying the Florida Panthers. Okay. Who I believe are located in Miami. They're like a mysterious team. Yeah, no one's exactly yeah, sure yeah, where they're yeah, from. Yeah. But they're going to go back to wherever they're from because the Lightning are just... So the Lightning are poising themselves to do back-to-back-to-back to back to back Stanley gonna, Cups. Who's it look like the other team? Oh, I don't know what's happening on the other side of okay, it. Okay. So uh, I think the Flame, Cal- Calgary Flames, and um, and I'm sure someone's yelling at the uh, radio right the now. They're listening, listening to us, but I, I think the Dallas Stars. Okay, and the it. NBA playoffs are still going on, but truth be told, they I know are. the Celtics. Golden State Warriors are crushing the Mavericks. Yeah, and the so Celtics in the Heat are playing that. I don't are know tight. what this series is. It, yeah. is it close? Uh, yeah. as, of, as of recording time, I think they're split. I think we decided we're rooting for Golden State. No. I don't. I don't think we decided anything. Who do we be- want to curse? Go oh, Miami. Oh yeah. Well, I guess as a Cleveland fan, I'm technically supposed to curse Golden State. All right. But I don't know. They're just really, really good. They're kind of fun to watch. I, oh, I really man. like Steph Curry, who's from Ohio, from Akron. Interestingly yeah. enough. Yeah, that's right. Good that's times. Right. It was great. It was. Is it time? It is time. Okay. Mm, I, I don't. Here we go. I, I got to do this faster. This is why we need somebody that's else right. on the that's soundboard. Yeah, we do. Ouch. You didn't have to agree completely. This is Scott Hahn. A highlight of our summer conference you sound season. Like, you sound yeah, like actually, Regis it really Martin. sounds a lot more it like, Regis, like Martin. Regis Martin. All right. This is Regis Martin. A highlight of our conference season is the Defending the Faith Conference with my good friend, Dr. Scott Hahn. Kind of hurts my voice. Yeah, I'm just going to keep just talking. Just to tell it. Yeah. Uh, coming up July 29th through 31st, it's more than an apologetics conference. Defending the Faith deepens your understanding of Catholic Church teaching and gives you ways to live your faith in everyday life. Speakers include Trent Horn. Because that's a horn. Dr. Edward Shree. Patrick Madrid. Always a fan favorite. Dr. Mary Healy. Oh, I love Dr. Mary Healy. Kimberly and Scott Hahn. Always awesome. 18 dynamic speakers in all, and probably two that aren't as dynamic. Throughout the weekend, you can immerse yourself in your faith through the holy sacrifice of Mass, the sacrament of reconciliation, praise and worship led by myself and Steubenville worship, quiet prayer at our Port Siuncala Chapel, and social time with other Catholics who share your love for your faith. I hope you can join me and... Oh, are you going to be there, Father Dave? Yep. I don't know why my voice got so high. At Defending the Faith Conference, July 29th through 31st. Find out more and register at SteubenvilleConferences.com. Apart from you, Franciscan University. That's SteubenvilleConferences.com. Are you giving a talk or are you doing the final liturgy or what? Yep. what's your vibe? Yep. You're doing both. I'm not sure. Oh. <laughs> It's far away. It's at the end of July. It is. But we do have our first conference, not this weekend, but next weekend. Power, Power and Purpose. purpose. Oh, it's going to be great. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm and, looking... oh, we should pre- we should tease this. We're going to do a live podcast with a guest. That's like kind of the the other universe in those mm. things that you do, right? Because like abiding. A multiverse? Yeah. The, this is like in a, a multi-universe They thing. that abide together with hope. So Heather Kim from Abiding Together is going to be a part of they that hope, and it's like two un- two worlds collide, rival nations. Wait, what is that from? Rocky, like oh, is that Eye of the Tiger? Yeah, nope, nobody knows movie. all the words to that song. Everyone just knows. Eh, no, that's eh, a different eh, song. Eh, eh, oh. But anyway, yeah, so that'll be fun. That's two weekends from well, basically almost two weeks. Yeah, so we'll be doing a live podcast, which doesn't mean we'll be showing it live, but we will be alive when it's recorded. So I guess really every podcast is And it's during one of the workshops, right? It is, yeah. Okay. It's an afternoon workshop. So I'm sure you can, uh, if you want to last minute, join us for that. Come to that conference. If it's you really If fun. you are not doing anything in two weeks, just come to the conference, hang out. Just show up. It'll be great. And then show up again for Defending the Faith. And any other conference we do, you can find out about all of them, studentvilleconferences.com. Dot com. Okay. Do you know how I knew you were on vacation? Tell me. Okay, so Bob and I sit down to begin the recording, and he goes, so, Corleone wrote a letter to Pelosi. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> I've, you know what was cool about going on vacation? That Before happened, we get into that, yeah. this, I haven't, this is how I was on vacation. I didn't even bring my computer. I powered it down. Mm. It probably hasn't been powered down since August. And it was very freeing. I didn't even bring an iPad, and I just tried to stay off my phone, and except for pictures with the fam. Yeah. It was really cool. But, yeah, now I, 
Now I'm getting back to life, and it's like, oh, that happened. Yeah. So was that a big deal? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is this because you told him to when he was here receiving his honorary doctorate where you're like, hey, Salvador, what's with this? No, but it was one of the conversations. We recorded a TV show with he, and it was one of the conversations we had about how do you deal with that. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting in the light of our conversation and him kind of sharing. I walked out of this thinking something's going on. Oh, the, because and, you did obviously the TV show before he made the announcement. Right, right. So. Well, right. We did the TV show on a Friday, and I believe he made the announcement on Monday. Maybe gotcha. Tuesday. Maybe, maybe, oh, no. Four, it doesn't matter. Four or five days. Okay, right. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, the Holy Father, uh, the Archbishop Cordelioni, Archbishop of San Francisco, has basically, I guess most people are aware, unless you're on vacation at Universal Studios. Or Disney World. Has said that um, Nancy Pelosi should not present herself to receive Eucharist in the Diocese of San Francisco. Okay. Um, now, and, did he, is he saying that if she does, people aren't going to give her that, communion? That, that she will be denied communion. Okay. Yep. Okay. Because okay. he wrote actually two letters, and it's, and it's important. If, if, you've, if, you've read the one, if you've read them, uh, the one that got most press was simply what he had stated about uh, her not coming to community. He mentioned a couple of things that, A, they, he had tried to reach out to her a couple of times. And, and really what's forcing it is since, it, please, Lord, it looks like R.V. Wade's can be turned over. Pelosi was one of the ones that's saying, okay, we need to codify this. We need to make it law, yeah. abortion. And and he, he, he shared with, with myself and a couple of others that he said that's just a bridge too far. Yeah. Is, is that w- what she's doing now is just a bridge too far. And so there's the letter that he wrote stating that she's not to present herself at Eucharist or for communion. And then he also wrote a letter to the priests in, in the diocese explaining why he did and, and what he did. And, and, and it's interesting. I mean, if you pay attention to this, this is something that's been going on between the Archbishop and Pelosi for well over a year. Right. And one of the things that he did that was really beautiful was he invited the uh, local diocese to pray for Pelosi, but not just Pelosi, but all Catholic pro-abortion uh, politicians. And, and he said a rosary for, and a rosary and a rose for Pelosi, and encouraging people to pray for her, pray a rosary for her, and I believe actually to send a rose to her, let her know that, that they've been praying for her. But apparently she did not respond to him this time. You know, he was trying to get out, get in touch with her and just talk to her about this. And she didn't respond. She didn't respond. And finally the archbishop said, you know, he's been praying about it and discerning it for quite some time. And he just felt that something finally had to be done. Um, interestingly, he, he, he stated that she can't go because of the, the grave sin, that, that she's promoting it, but also the scandal uh, that's being presented. You know, he said a number of people, because Nancy Pelosi always talks about how she loves being Catholic and faithful right. Catholic and always talks about her kids. And it was interesting. I listened to a, an interview that Cordelioni did, and, and he said he doesn't question that. He doesn't question whether or not she loves her family, whether or not she loves being a mother, even whether or not she loves her faith. He said, I'm not to judge that. But what I am to say is that her public stance in favor of abortion, and not just that, but doing things to, to making sure that more people can get abortions is just – that's inconsistent with, with the faith. So he said, in, until you publicly uh, repudiate what you'd said about abortion and go to confession, you are not to present yourself to the Eucharist. And the world's gone crazy. I mean, everybody is, you know, how can he do this? It was interesting. Whoopi Goldberg today on The View, she, she had a comment. Oh, what was her comment? Her, she says, uh, and, I, and I wrote it down just because it was so, so enlightened. Somebody said, just because you play nonsense doesn't mean you know anything about being Catholic. <laughs> Another person it said, was Sister Act, by the way. Uh, another person, not, yeah, that's right. Another person said that she's a few sandwiches short of a picnic. But um, <laughs> she, he says, uh, she says, "Hey, dude, this is not no, this is not your job, dude. It's not up to you. Uh, it's it's the Eucharist. The communion is for sinners, and it's not your job to do this." And a lot of people are like, "It is literally that's exactly his job. His job right. to do this." <laughs> But it was like she says. Whoopi Goldberg goes on to say, is, "Why are we separ- Why are we? What about the separation of church and state?" And and she just she has absolutely no idea what she's talking about. But the thing that was interesting about it's hard it, to believe that the View isn't giving really accurate news information, especially about really? the Catholic Church. I'm stunned. Yeah, I thought that's she, a bigger story I, I for thought, me. I thought but. she held a degree, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. But um, the it's interesting because the Archbishop made it clear that. The canon that he was stating, and I'm going to check, I think it's kind of 915, but it might be, 
Yeah, it's 915. Is in actually the, the catechism related to the sacraments. Mm. So he said this is not a penalty. This isn't a penal action. It's not a penalty. It's not a saint. It's for the care of her soul and for the care of the souls of the church and the people in the church, that that's why he's making this step. And there were three elements that, that Pope Francis talked about. And some people have been saying, well, a lot of people supporting Whoopi Goldberg said that Pope Francis said you can't do this. No, Pope Francis said this can't be a political issue. It has yes. to be a pastoral issue. And that's exactly how Cordelione is going about this. He's, he said, I'm not making this a political issue. Everybody else wants to. This is a fundamental issue. A, it's the teaching of the church. Yeah. It's scriptural. You know, they, they bring condemnation on yourself. It's causing scandal. People are saying, how can this person be a good Catholic and, and be promoting abortion uh, and the care, of the care of the individual soul and the soul of the community? So when he says that this isn't a, it's not a penalty, but it's actually for care, that's exactly what the Pope Francis was said, is that this is not to be a political issue. It's supposed to be a pastoral issue. Cordelione says, I absolutely agree, and that's the way, one of the reasons that he went about it the way he did. Um, so it's, yeah, it was the talk of, yeah. of every Catholic, organization in the country. For so I've learned, I learned about this a little bit through a podcast that I've just been listening to you right now, as you say it. And, um, you know, what does seem to be a shift, as you mentioned, would be Roe v. Wade being flipped. And, um, and she seemed to be a, the ringleader of mobilizing everybody to make it again, just was it, would it, was it, was she talking about like an amendment? No, or codified it. She wanted to make it law. And this would be like a federal law. Yes. Then. Right. Right. right, right. So this is a little bit different than a politician just supporting a law that already exists exactly. or, 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 that's or going. saying that it's, it's, you know, I'm personally opposed, but it's, right. it's the constitution says, yeah. you know, you have yeah, this protection. She's going, she's going full throttle yeah. with that. And you're right. That scripture, uh, and I, I'm trying to remember if it's Corinthians or not. It, it, St. Paul was warning, those in Corinth, that if you're not receiving the Eucharist right, you are actually eating and drinking your own damnation, yeah, yeah. you know, not your own salvation. And there is a manner in which that the church... Now, for some, they would be saying, what took you so long? And um, I don't know. I mean, and it's... This, a, it's this a, is, the, and, and this is exactly where the one part of this that I struggle with, and <coughs> excuse me, I think I, I, I respect and, and think actually... Archbishop did the right thing on this. Yeah. But it's not something to be celebrated mm. in, in the sense that the f and he said the same thing. He said the same thing is that this is a sad moment. The fact that I have to do this doesn't cause me joy. It's not like right. yeah, you know, finally I get to bring the hammer down. I mean, he 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 would be saying and we would believe, you know, obviously consistent with the teaching of the church is her separated from the Eucharist is is a horrible thing, right. you know. Which which just shows the seriousness of this event that that the archbishop would say that I just this just can't continue, but there have been people out there that are, you know, yay this is good go after all these other people and yeah. and, and and I listened to a a podcast actually it was done the first day right after uh, the archbishop made this and one of the things that he did and he did a really good job at clarifying why Pelosi and maybe not another Catholic uh, politician, but that there was things that were different. And he, he got real specific about the types of laws and, and that a Catholic could vote in conscience of a law that the effect might be that abortion comes about. But the act, the reason you're doing this would be, like he said, um, uh, a Catholic could vote for parental notification. Mm. You know, you don't just not vote on that. If, if the law says, okay, you have to notify your parents if you're going to get an abortion, some people would say, oh, you can't even vote on that. And he said, no, you can vote on that because notification of the parents is actually a good thing. So he, he does a really nice job at, at what made Pelosi so different. And, and it is, as you alluded, is that she is like the ringleader in all this, is mm. the Speaker of the House. And, and that, that, again, he said that this is just a bridge too far. And she was very vocal about being Catholic. It wasn't somebody that's just like, well, you know, I kind of Catholic, but I don't talk about it. Right. Like it's she interesting. Was, she was really ringing the bell of being Catholic for you know, you could argue for p political reasons well, as well. And that's that's what the other people have said is that, you know, he said, I'm not politicizing that. They said, don't, don't use the Eucharist as a political tool. And he said, I'm not. But he said there are politicians who, in fact, are using the Eucharist right. as a political tool. Do you think now, I don't know anything. Do you think that this was something she was, she, I don't know. No, I, I'm going to take it back. 
I was going to say saw like, it coming or well, I'm sure she saw it coming and I don't know if it becomes like a martyrdom type yeah, thing. Yeah. And oh yeah. There's, I mean, I mean it's interesting. But I guess we can't read her mind or know what's yeah, going on. Yeah. The local her. newspaper in San Francisco wrote an op-ed piece saying how horrible the archbishop is and how wonderful Nancy Pelosi. And I'm thinking you've got to be kidding me. You, you, you're, you're literally, <laughs> yeah. you're preaching to the archbishop about what it is to be Catholic and what it is to be. A, I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just unbelievable. And you know, they probably wrote that op-ed like, two years ago yeah, and they were just, just waiting, waiting waiting for the moment to do it. You know, the thing that strikes me about this, and I think um, what the Archbishop said, which would probably be good just for all of us to do as well, it's a pastoral issue, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's always like the, the topic of we want people who, you know, don't follow the teachings of the church, you know, to do this or to do that, or why doesn't the church do this? And we can't help but see everything in a political landscape. I mean, it's similar. I, I remember... I actually don't remember what. Well, you just said you do remember. And I do remember, and then remember. I forgot. Thank okay. you. It is late at night, yeah, you know. It is. It right, is. and I did just get and off. You have been traveling all day. <laughs> I know, exactly. I remember somebody died, and it was like maybe a terrorist or something, and we were just even saying we should never rejoice yeah, yeah, when yeah, something yeah. like that happens. And so there might be a part of us that say, it's really great that somebody's standing up for the Eucharist. And I think that is a... I get that. That's a cause for rejoicing. Right, right, right. That's, I get you know, that. The, the bishops are taking a stand or a bishop is taking a stand. That should be applauded, I think. I mean, good if it bears good fruit. But at the heart of it, there should be a sense of, oh, that's so sad. Why do we though. have to be here exactly? Yeah, yeah. The, the question that I've asked that I don't know is, I don't know if Pelosi actually goes to church. Again, this is, I'm not making a judgment statement right. on that. I, I, now, Biden talks fairly often about going to church. You know, he do, I mean, it's, yeah. it seems to be a part of his life. I don't know if he goes every Sunday, but he does speak about it. He's, you see him at church. I don't know if Pelosi does. I mean, does this, again, and it's only in the Archdiocese of, of San Francisco. If the Archbishop in um, Washington, D.C. doesn't want to do something, then that doesn't affect well, yeah, I was actually about to ask that. No, Has this had the, any no, other ramifications? Nope. This is just... Just the Archdiocese of, of uh, San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But again, and, and I would say the same thing that our Archbishop Cardellone said, and that is um, to pray for her. I would also encourage people to pray for Archbishop. I mean, it was really a courageous thing knowing, I mean, this is the Speaker of the House, one of the more influential politicians in the United States. It was a very courageous thing that he did. And, and a you, pray- would, you could argue she is, outside of Biden, the most influential. Even, I mean— Oh, I was going to say such a horrible joke. Oh, <laughs> good. No, I'm I did. glad you did. I, I held back. I held back <laughs> because we would have to cut it anyway. <laughs> Should we, yeah. we even cut that we're referencing yeah, yeah, it? No, that's fine. Okay. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, in some ways more than the vice president. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so pray for pray for Pelosi, pray for all Catholic politicians, and pray for Archbishop Cordelione. Amen. Yeah. Hey, speaking of pro-life opportunities, uh, we have a we have another promo. By the way, we take promos. If you just email them to us at hope at franciscan.edu, more often than not, we're really happy to share, especially if it's for charity and a good cause. And this is both. Um, there is a. Have you heard of biking for babies? I have not. Well, it's not a biker gang. No, um, it's actually people on bicycles. Babies who it's bike. A, it, well, <laughs> that would be cute. It's a pro-life nonprofit aiming to rebuild the culture of life by forming young adult missionaries who raise financial support and awareness for pregnancy resource centers. Our missionaries ride bicycles over a hundred miles a day to witness to the beauty of every life and to spread the good news of life-affirming pregnancy resource centers who provide support. Uh, who provide support for women and families locally and nationally. Our 2022 national ride is in July, six different starting points across the nations. Um, All the endings of the locations will be celebration of life events. And if you're not familiar with biking for babies, you can go to bikingforbabies.com. Not the number four, just bikingforbabies.com. They're trying to raise uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for these pregnancy resource centers. That's really cool, and it's super awesome. So, so who so, wrote us? Sarah. Oh, cool. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sarah. No, that's really cool. Yeah. I think that's a really. Yeah, good she's idea. a volunteer, and she yeah. just sent us an email about it. So we just encourage everybody, you know. And again, that's the positive thing that we want to be doing. Yeah. You know, just like let's respond by helping pregnancy centers and one baby at a time. W- one baby on a bike. At a time. That's what I want to see. If you have photos of babies on, on bikes, bikes yes. we would like to see that. Yeah, actually, I don't because that's horribly dangerous. Father Dave has never seen a baby on a bike, and they would fall over and hurt themselves. Maybe a little bike, like a tricycle. A baby on a trike. Seriously, I don't know how you made it out of 
adolescents. Anyway. Baseball. <laughs> hey, uh, let's get to our final. Uh, it's not our final. No, no, let's close it. this podcast at yep. least. And we are talking uh, today about the petition in the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. I'm, I've, I'm looking forward to this one. I spent, <laughs> I spent quite you were as of, prepared on this one as I was about the Nancy I, Pelosi I, conversation. I spent quite a bit of time getting ready for this. There are seven petitions in the Our Father. Yep, um, number four. The first three are about, it's not, un, it's not unsimilar to the Ten Commandments, where the first few commandments are specifically about God. Or the seven virtues. And the uh, last ones are specifically about our needs. So we covered... Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done. Now we've got four more petitions, uh, and today we're talking about give us this day our daily bread. And we are reading uh, Catechism 2828 and following to uh, 2837, uh, just as the highlights of it. If you want to, those of you following along at home, and man, I, um, so I always think Eucharist, right? And that's not wrong. You no, know, there's, no. there, there's a manner in which, you know, I think the daily bread, what's our daily bread, the Eucharist. But I realized as I reflected on what the church had to teach us about it, you know, just like the liturgy is more than just reception of the Eucharist, um, though the Eucharist is at the heart of it and the pinnacle of it, same with this petition. Okay, let me just oh, under, underline that point. That's a really important point, is, yeah. is that, that the Eucharist is... The celebration of the Eucharist is also a proclamation of the word. It's also a community mm. gathered. It's also recognizing of the symbol of the priest. So that's really important that I think sometimes we go to liturgy and it's it's just everything's just kind of fluff until we get to the Eucharist. And and like you said, it's it's the the font of this, it's primary, but it's it's taken in the context of liturgy. Right. Yep. Yeah. And then people receive it and they take off and they don't know why people are like, Maybe you should stay Maybe you could but wait if the only is over. but if the only reason you were there in your mind to get is something. to get the Eucharist. Yeah. Well there you go. There. And I'd say in a similar way the beautiful thing of this petition is yes, spoiler alert, we're gonna get to the Eucharist at the heart of this petition, but there is so much more. It actually the catechism breaks us breaks this into different phrases. So give us is the first part of this. And it talks about this filial trust. Like my kids always like, give me something. It's not mm -hmm. even polite about it. I'm like, can you say the magic word? But this idea that now. we depend on our dad. Remember, this is the Our Father prayer. And we have this filial trust that we can ask our father for what we need. In fact, that's what, something that Jesus said. Which of you, as evil as you are, if your son asked for a piece of bread, would give him a stone? Sure. So if that's how you behave to each other, how much more will your heavenly father take care of you? And so this is a part of the e expectation of God's providence in our life, that we can say, give me this. Right, you know, right, right, you right. Know, the, the trust of children who look to their father for everything is beautiful. Yeah. That was the statement it made. And I love, again, the, the, when, I, when I focus on that, it's a younger child. It's not, it's, you know, it's not a, there's something innocent and something beautiful about a child coming and, and wanting or needing and, and the father delighting in being able to give that to them. Yeah. It must be cool like on Christmas to give kids yeah, their birthdays cool. and stuff. Yeah, there's just something about that that's really beautiful. Sometimes I'm more excited to give them yeah, the gift yeah, than they yeah, are. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. So. That's cool. Um, so give us is an that's expression of trust. That's because you guys usually share the same gifts, but that's a side Shh. note. Thankfully, my kids don't listen to this podcast. Um, this day, it goes on to say, is also an expression of trust taught to us by the Lord, because there's a lot of symbolism in the today, right, the day of God. Yeah. You know, like this day is the day of the resurrection. If today you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. You know, there there's this statement of we are living in a new day that the Lord has made, and it's a day of resurrection. It's a day of life, and so this is the moment. This is the day that right. we're coming before the Lord in resurrection you know, anticipation and hope. Right. The other day is it's this day of this, the day this, one of the other, you know, ideas of the day is the day that the two worlds collide, that the kingdom of God, the mm -hmm. kingdom of the, that they come together in the incarnation. So that day is this, like almost a culmination of the two worlds coming together. Yeah. So. Amen. And then we get to our bread. And what was cool that this was the thing, as I reflected on this and read this, that really struck me the most. It talks about, there is a material level to this, and there's the spiritual. Like I said, I quickly jump to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. But it talks about like meeting the material needs. Like We have a God who isn't just 
spiritual without any material. Like he really does want to provide for us. And we want to be praying um, not only for our material needs, but it goes back to this thing. This idea of the phrase give us is different than give me. Mm -hmm. And when we pray this prayer, we're praying it as a body of Christ and we're praying it for others. There are people who are hungry. I mean, just literally (laughs) physically hungry who really actually would just love to have some actual bread. I mean, like Mm -hmm. beyond any symbolism or anything else. And so just to think like, gosh, there are people who are dying of hunger right now. Mm -hmm. Give us this day. Like we are praying this together as a human family that needs would be met, that, uh, you know, material needs would be met. Yeah, and maybe just word, and I realize that the Our Father is not, the only place is not, it's not only in the Eucharist that we celebrate and we pray the Our Father, but one of the things that I appreciate about that is give us our daily bread and that the Eucharist is not this personal, just this personal Jesus right. and me, but it's a community gathered, and, and I think that's really imperative that we think about that, that a part, I mean, that's what's so central about the Eucharist is we come together as a community, we come together broken, we come together hungry, and some days I'm better than, than the person. I, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling more nourished, more full than the person next to me. So we're praying for that person next to me, the one that's really hungry, that we may not even be aware of. And the idea is uh, this great quote in the Catechism. Our bread is the one loaf for the many. That's cool. In the Beatitudes, poverty is the virtue of sharing. I love that line. Poverty mm. is the virtue of sharing. Now, you took a vow of poverty, so you have a, a sense of that. It's not just abject being poor and you get nothing. It's really a life of sharing what you have with others. Right, right, right. That's what I loved, uh, you know, my the few times I've had the chance to go to Haiti and seeing people who the world would consider very, very poor. The gen- are some of the most generous people. The generosity yeah. they have. You're and, absolutely right. And that's the virtue of poverty. Like when the yeah. Lord talks about being poor, it's this attitude of we help detached. each other. Right, and right, detached. Right, right, right. Yeah, we help each other. And then we get to um, this idea of the bread. And not just our bread, daily bread. So the Greek... You can correct me if I'm wrong. Epiousis? Sounds great. Okay, that sounds good. Epiousis, which is literally means super essential. <laughs> like we can't go without this. Right. Like it's super essential. Like it is the most important thing that we need in our life. And, of course, the fullness of that is the Eucharist. Uh, it is the medicine of immortality without which we have no life within us. Finally, in this connection, the heavenly meaning is evident. This day is the day of the Lord. It's a feast of the kingdom anticipated in the Eucharist that is already the foretaste of the kingdom to come. For this reason, it is fitting for the Eucharistic liturgy to be celebrated every day. Isn't that a great line? The medicine of immortality. Yeah. It's the thing we yeah, most yeah. desperately need. Yeah, so need. like my body is wasting away, literally wasting away, and I want to be immortal we take the Eucharist in this, I mean, it, it sounds like a superpower, right? But right. the Eucharist is that which is going to help make me immortal. That's just a beautiful image. And the idea that as the church prays this, you know, the Eucharistic liturgy should be celebrated each day, even if you don't receive the Eucharistic, you know, if, even if you don't receive the Eucharist every day, mm-hmm. even if you can't make it to Mass every day, mm-hmm. this prayer and this petition is part of the entire prayer of the church. You might remember, if you've been listening to the other episodes that we've had on it, what do we do after the Eucharist is consecrated? We pray the Our Father prayer. We dare to pray this prayer. Right. And Give us this bread. Right. Yeah. And, and we are, you know, it's this invitation of the Lord is providing for his people. The Lord is providing for the church, the body of Christ, and giving the church the Eucharist it needs at the fullness of it in the sacrament of the Eucharist, but also just in everything, you know, whether it be the material or the spiritual we come together as a family. We recognize maybe you are in a place, maybe you're in a great place in your life right now. You know, maybe things are going really well. Maybe you've never known what it means to be hungry. Um, we have brothers and sisters who are having a tough time. We have brothers and sisters who are going hungry. And we, we pray this petition together with a hope and a trust in the providence of God who will take care of all of our needs and the most important need being salvation from sin. Right. And, and that's what we celebrate in this right. super essential gift. Yeah, it's interesting just to circle back to the statement about Corleone and Pelosi. Somebody asked him, can she go to Mass? And he said, yes. Yeah. She just can't present herself with Eucharist. And that, I thought that was even in that, that there was this, you're still welcome here, but to, to consummate it, right? To consummate yeah. it, that you can't just, in the state that you're in, you just can't do that, which, which on one level is, 
there's something beautiful about that. You can still come. Yeah. But it's also the beauty and the richness and the power that is in the Eucharist. Yes, you can come, but this, that's just a step you can't make. You know, maybe this is a good way to conclude it, but and I might have shared this before. I get to do a lot of ministry with evangelicals especially, and the fact that they uh, can't receive the Eucharist is painful, not in the sense that they, they might not have a fullness of— they certainly don't fully understand what Catholics believe, but, you know, their attitude is, we would let you receive our Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Why can't we receive— your Eucharist. And the heart of it is the reception of the Eucharist is saying amen to everything the church believes. It's right. not just a symbol that we go up and receive and it's right. just about us, you know, all being, we're all in it together. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. It is saying, I believe in the, the transubstantiated body, blood, soul, and divinity of this Eucharist. I believe in the authority of the priest, yeah. which means I believe in the authority of the church and the scriptures that are proclaimed. And like the high point of being Catholic, your full initiation is in the Eucharist. It's, yeah, yeah, and and yeah. that's partly, I guess, it goes back to this earlier thing of such a serious thing for her to not be able to receive, but she's put herself in a situation where she's clearly showing, even aggressively showing, yeah. that she doesn't believe everything that the Church believes, right. and uh, in in a very in a very serious state. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because one of the, it, this sounds really odd, and it's kind of a pet peeve. It's odd, and it's a pet peeve of mine as well. I love hearing the communicant uh, come to communion and say Amen. There's mm-hmm. something about that proclamation of faith that I think is is really beautiful. And there's been several times, I mean, several lots of times that if they don't say something, I invite them. I said, you know, the body of Christ, and I realize in an extraordinary form that they don't do that, but in in the Nova Sorta, we say amen, that the rubric calls us to say amen. And I just think there's something, that very simple proclamation, amen, yes, I believe. I believe that, that the, the bread that you're giving me is not bread, but it's it's the Eucharist, and I believe in, in everything that's led us to this, in the scriptures, and the priest, and the orders, and yeah, so that's, yeah, that's really beautiful. Amen. 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 <laughs> there you go again. All right, it's, are you closing with prayer or am I? I think you can. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of faith. We, at this very moment, pray for the speaker, Pelosi. Lord, that you would move in her heart and bring her closer to you and bring a transformation and conversion. And we pray for a greater respect and dignity of life. We pray for the Archbishop, and Lord, we pray for each one of us that you would give us our daily bread. We thank you for those who are listening. Those who are struggling most today, Lord, let them know your peace and your blessing. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. See you, Bob. See you, Father Dave. And hey, we got people who emailed us. I was on vacation, but it works. Thank you for your emails. I'll (laughs) I'll read them this week. And if you'd like to shoot us an email, hope at franciscan.edu. Hope at franciscan.edu. Bike for babies. God bless.